Welcome back, everybody. This is the second last uh, webinar of this season. So uh, we are going to be talking about the PowerG uh, photoelectric beams today. And then uh, as a reminder, next week, you know, I don't think anybody want to miss this will be uh, kind of the, we'll call it the big screen debut of IQ Lockdown. We'll be doing a, a technical webinar on IQ uh, Lockdown next week, which we'll be showing uh, extensively at ISC. So as we're just letting everybody drop in, um, you know, still a lot of people dropping in. Please find the questions box, drop in, you know, say hi, where are you calling from, let us know. Uh, we're just going to run a few quick polls, and then we will uh, get started. You know, there is actually two presenters today. There is Mark and, and Dave. Unfortunately, we're, you know, this is live, right? We're having a bit of a technical challenge with Dave's camera, so he's just going to be that voice off screen. Right? So here we go. Let's get those uh, polls quickly launched. Here we go. How often are you installing outdoor motion detectors? Right? So nice and simple. All right, so it's a lot of people down in the zero to 25% range. And I think uh, hopefully after you see this presentation today on our on our new uh, PowerG photoelectric beam, I think that might change a bit, uh, but there we go. It's about, yeah, about 90% are between the zero to 25% percent percentile. So uh, very good. I'm gonna just give that poll just a couple more seconds to give everybody a chance to vote. All righty, we'll close that poll off. And we will go with our next one. Uh, what applications are you currently utilizing uh, outdoor motions in? Perimeter, automation, notifications, alert. This is a choose all that apply, so you know, feel free. Uh, select, you know, if you have multiples, select multiple. All right, so a lot of perimeter detection. Not as much automation, surprising. Um, and, uh, you know, about 50% of you using it for notifications and alerts. So very, very good. Um, give that one just a couple more seconds. Yeah, it's staying pretty steady. About half of you using it for notifications and about 70% for perimeter detection and yeah, about 20% for automation. So we will just give that one, close it off. Three quick more ones. What percentage of the time are you installing PowerG devices? We all want to see 75 to 100% here, so let's go. Uh, okay, so uh, 70, 80, yeah, a lot of, yeah, there we go. This is what we expected to see. So currently, yeah, it's about uh, 75% or more than 50% of the time using Empower-G. That is awesome. But 50% between the 75 and 100% group uh, is very, very good. We do love our Power-G. All right. Give that one just a couple more secs. There we go. And here we go. For those who are using Power-G, what is the number one reason? Is it range, battery life, encryption, the two-way communication, or just to eliminate service calls and go-backs? Tough to choose just one, right? I, I, I wanted to put, you know, select all that apply, but we want to know the number one reason, right? So range seems, range is very heavily in first, uh, and then eliminating service calls and go-backs. So very, very interesting. Uh, I expected to see more on the battery life, but that is great. Thank you very much. All right, and last but not least, here we go, because we are going to ISC. Are you planning on attending ISC? It's a yes or no or an undecided at this point. All right, so it's still a high percentage. Oh, it's, be it's way better than previous, right? So a lot, it sounds like a few more people are a little more comfortable, uh, you know, getting out and about. So we're seeing a little more yeses than in previous polls. So that is great. Well, we truly do hope to see you at ISC. We've got a lot. Uh, you know, our booth is going to be incredible. We're going to have a lot of new products. We're going to show, you know, some concept stuff. Uh, you know, we're really hoping we get to see everybody there. So I'm going to close this off, and I'm going to hand this off to Mark and Dave. All yours. Thank you, Neil. Uh, excited to be here with you guys today. Again, my camera for some reason just decided it wanted to quit today, but um, I'm the technical account manager for the northeast part of the northeast part of the United States. So that's like PA, Maryland, Delaware, Indiana, Ohio, and a few other uh, places as well. So I'm super excited to be here with you to talk about photoelectric beams, and I am joined by Mark. Hey there, I'm Mark Sterling. I'm the technical account manager in the uh, Pacific Northwest region, covered nine states out uh, this way. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to talking to you guys about the, the photo beams. Thanks, Mark. <clears throat> so let's get into photo beams. First, I think it's important to talk about what is a photo beam. 
So a photo beam is an active infrared, much like what we're typically used to. We're used to PIRs or passive infrared motion detectors. They're looking for a change in temperature between each zone. Well, an active infrared is, is uh, I liken it to uh, like a Mission Impossible movie or a 007 movie where there's this laser that's going across the hallway. And if that laser gets broken that you can see, you're having to crawl underneath it. Well, with, with an active infrared, like these photo beams, you can't see it because it's infrared, but it's still a beam going between the transmitter and the receiver. And when that beam is broken for a specific amount of time, which you can select, that's when the system goes into alarm or sends the notification. And I should also say that um, something that I'd like to do is open up your mind today. Uh, and we'd like to have you think about these photo beams as we go through the presentation of more than just a, a way to detect someone doing something nefarious. A lot of the times what I've said for years is we've got to help homeowners and business uh, owners look at the system as not so much as a cost, it's something looked at negatively, but it's something looked at that can help them uh, either improve their home life or help them improve the way that their business operates. So just kind of keep that open. Um, as we go through the presentation. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the models and the specifications first. So first, let's talk about the big boy. The big boy is the PG9350SL, and, and we're calling that the long-range photoelectric beam. We call it long-range because of the distance that you can have between transmitter and receiver. That distance on this one is 350 feet. It's got four beams, so it's got a top set of heads and a bottom set of heads that send and receive, depending on which, which side you're on, the beam itself. It's also got four channels, and later on we'll have a better understanding of what those four channels, what that actually means. It also uses 3.6 volt, 13 amp hour, LSH20 lithium batteries. The part number that we have for that is cl dash PP1. Why do I mention that? Because like a few other devices that we manufacture, these, uh, the receiver and the transmitter do not come with batteries. So you'll need to order that at the same time that you're placing the order for the transmitter itself uh, or the receiver. What's great about the CLPP1 part number is that it comes with four batteries. Now in, in the 9350, you have the option to either power it with two batteries or power it with four batteries. If you power it with four batteries on both the transmitter and receiver side, you'll get a little bit longer battery life, uh, but you can just use two in one and two in the other. This device is also IP65 rated, and it's using um, Power G for its transmission back to the primary control panel, whether that's a Power Series Neo, Power Series Pro, IQ4, uh, they all can be used. You can use this device on any one of them. So we want to run over some easy install features with this one. Uh, just to give you a quick rundown on this slide, we've got a sniper viewfinder. I'll talk about what that means in the next slide. We've got a vivid interior color. We've got an alignment dial, an LED indicator, and a beam blocking plate. So let's first talk about the sniper viewfinder. Uh, I would just installed mine uh, here recently. And I found that sniper viewfinder really gave me two times the magnification so that when I'm looking across my yard, I can say, no, that's the that's the neighbor's garage. And uh, I need to keep going uh, until I actually see that 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 orange color. And it just helped me because it has that two times magnification helped me to uh, sight in my target a lot better. Talking about the vivid interior color, which we have on the next slide. Uh, it was really simple uh, because of the the orange that's on that device. Super simple to just look at it and say, oh, that's what I need. It's no longer, you know, just a random black color. Uh, a lot of times when we use photo beans in the past, it was just all black, kind of hard to get it dialed in. But because of that orange color, uh, we're able to dial that in pretty easily. <laughs> Next, let's talk about the alignment dials. Uh, those alignment dials just provide an easy way of adjusting the lenses. You can either adjust it horizontally by 90 degrees, or you can adjust it vertically uh, by 10 degrees. So it makes for a real efficient install. 
um, whenever you're looking through the sniper viewfinder, instead of having to take a screwdriver or some other weird method, you just have to put your thumb or finger right on those dials and it will adjust it as you need it to. And for the next, I'll turn to Mark to explain the rest of the uh, benefits. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Uh, so moving towards the uh, LED indicator lights, uh, there's three lights on the receiver side, uh, alarm indicator LED, uh, a level indicator LED, and a low battery indicator. Uh, obviously, the low battery one would uh, turn on uh, when it has a low battery. Uh, and then the level indicator helps with really getting it uh, started off with getting it dialed in for the alignment. Uh, so as you can see, um, uh, there's four different types of that uh, level indicator light to appear uh, when it's not aligned at all whatsoever. That light will be a solid red. Uh, as you uh, start to get it lined up uh, a little bit more, that will start to blink. So it'll have a fast blink uh, to it. Uh, and then it will start to become a little bit slower. Uh, and then as the level indicator light turns off, then you know that it is uh, the getting lined up. Um, and then once the level indicator light turns off, then you would want to pivot over to uh, utilizing your multimeter uh, on the uh, receiver side. So it's really a good idea to start at the transmitter side uh, with the alignment uh, and then go towards, uh, move towards the receiver because the receiver side is the only side that has the monitor jack output where you can land your multimeter on it uh, to test the voltage. So when you're on the receiver side, uh, using those adjustments that Dave talked about uh, on the last slide for the dials, uh, then you use your multimeter, turn those dials around, and your monitor jack output, you'll want to watch uh, to try to get the voltage uh, as close to 3 volts uh, as possible. Now with the 350-foot uh, range one, 2.8 volts is, is excellent, uh, but you can get it all the way up to 3 volts. Um, and then there's the alarm indicator light uh, on the top that uh, would obviously go off in a alarm uh, condition. Uh, on the inside of the cover, there is this beam uh, blocking plate uh, that is good to utilize uh, when you are getting it uh, lined up appropriately. So you'll want to cover one set of the beams, like the lower ones first, and then get the top one dialed in. Uh, and then vice versa, uh, switch it around to uh, beam blocking the, the top plate uh, and then get the lower one uh, dialed in secondarily. Moving towards reliable uh, uh, performance. So the, uh, the 350 SL slimline one has four different beams on it and you have to get all four of them 100% blocked for it to go into an alarm. So it really comes down to application based as far as which photo beams you want to utilize in, in the proper applications. So like uh, the second picture down on the, on the right side, uh, you can see a bird flying through and breaking the top uh, two beams, but the lower two beams are not uh, broken. So that would not go into an alarm. Now you could potentially utilize that beam blocking uh, device and block the lower two beams if you needed to get further range than 200 feet uh, because the the top one uh, that Dave will talk a little bit more about in a minute here the top one with the narrow beam the uh, twin beams that one goes up to uh, 200 feet so if you needed dual beams uh, in longer range then use the 350 foot range one and block uh, either the upper beam or the lower beams uh, to get your further range uh, and these lenses uh, are actually aspherical lenses, uh, which is a better lens than Fresnel lenses. It gets a more uh, direct and precise um, uh, precision to get it dialed in uh, for uh, better ac activity there. <clears throat> now, uh, these are the different uh, channels that you can adjust the transmitter and receiver to. Uh, so there's channel one, two, three, and four. Uh, it's always best to 
Uh, if you're using multi, multi, multiple um, uh, beams, like on the bottom here, stacking them, uh, you want to make sure that they're not on the same channel. You always want to have uh, a difference of two channels. So either one and three or two and four. Uh, if you can see that on the right set of beams, beams, those ones are stacked and uh, we're utilizing two and four over there. But on the far left, uh, you're using one and three. Uh, it's best to do that so you don't get crosstalk um, with them firing the same uh, direction. Uh, if you were utilizing, uh, say, channel one and two, then you could easily uh, have crosstalk uh, of the uh, pulses getting all mixed up. Uh, and causing false alarms. <clears throat> uh, this this picture in the top right here, that's basically just showing, uh, make sure to not use different model numbers uh, for uh, firing back and forth between each other. Uh, you always wanna stay consistent with 350 to 350 and 200 uh, to 200. <clears throat> Now the beam inter interruption uh, time frame. There's four different settings for that. Uh, so you, it is defaulted at 50 milliseconds. So if somebody's running through, it will uh, trigger that as long as 100% of the beams uh, are being blocked. Uh, now you can adjust that to be higher, up to 100 milliseconds for kind of like a jogging, uh, or 250 milliseconds for walking. Uh, slow movement of 500 milliseconds. Uh, if you set it to 500 milliseconds, maybe that's on top of some fence. So somebody's like crawling up and over that fence line uh, to uh, have them uh, cover that beam for a total of up to 500 uh, milliseconds. <clears throat> now there's also this uh, thing called the DQ output. It's basically environmental disqualification. So by default, the, the photo beam is set up to have two separate outputs. Uh, so basically there is a DQ output and then the alarm output. Uh, the environmental disqualification becomes a factor if there is uh, definitely like heavy fog and that voltage uh, drops because it's so dense with the fog uh, that the voltage on the, the beam will drop. Uh, and if it gets below one volt, then it will cause an alarm. Uh, and below one volt is a general statement. Uh, whenever it gets below one volt, then it will trip an alarm. But there is kind of a threshold where if it senses any sort of fog, uh, it could cause that DQ environmental uh, trouble condition. Uh, so it will arise by default as a trouble condition. And then if that comes through, and then secondarily there's an alarm, uh, then you guys would know oh, hey, that was an environmental uh, trouble condition. Uh, there is a way of shunting uh, this, uh, but you just need to be careful with it uh, so that if you do shunt it, you have that setting uh, triggered to uh, shunt the um, alarm uh, and it triggers the DQ output, then that means that you, you won't get an alarm uh, signal if somebody was to, say, walk in front of that photo beam. Uh, until it kind of levels out uh, and the fog clears. If you guys need more uh, insight into this, uh, definitely please reach out to your local TAM. Uh, I know this setting can be a little confusing. So, uh, Moving into the tamper. Uh, so there is a front tamper uh, and a tamper on the back side of the unit. Uh, if you are getting uh, like a false tamper, uh, more than likely, it would be the one on the back side. So I would look at that a little bit closer to try to get that dialed in so the back tamper is getting pushed in uh, appropriately. We also have a battery saving timer. Uh, by default, this is off, uh, which means that your alarm output uh, by default will get triggered every up to every five or five seconds at minimum. Uh, if you disable uh, uh, the battery, or sorry, if you turn on the battery saving timer, then the alarm output actually adjusts to up to two minutes. Uh, so it just depends on your application. If you're wanting uh, to have that alarm output get triggered more often, then obviously you would keep the battery saver, saving timer in the off uh, position. Uh, 
but if you're wanting to try to extend that battery life out as much as possible, uh, then you want to turn that on. And that is one of those uh, dip switches uh, on the side on the orange uh, portion of the unit. Thanks, Mark. Um, so now what we're going to do is we are going to go through the PG9200AX. And this is uh, what we are calling the short range. Uh, don't think of range as um, as the range back to the receiver, just the distance that you can put between the transmitter and the receiver of uh, this device itself. So this has a 200 foot wide range. It's got two beams, as Mark said earlier, it still has four channels. Uh, it has uh, the same batteries, but those batteries, um, you can only fit two of those within transmitter and receiver, unlike the 350 where you have four uh, per side. It's IP55 rated and it uses PowerG, of, uh, obviously. So the next thing we want to talk about is the just a couple of features on it. It's got a viewfinder, not not as um, honed in or as as close as the sniper viewfinder, but we have that. There's an alignment dial, just the same, and there's the same LED indicator. Uh, so let's break those down just a little bit. Uh, we have the viewfinder right there uh, is in the middle, so the right or the left side. Make sure that whenever you're aligning these, whether you're using the 350 or if you're using the 200, make sure that you're always aligning from the same side. So if you're using the left side all the time, just kind of get used to, I'm always gonna align these things on the left side, um, unless obviously you can't because it's a little bit closer to a corner or something like that. So you have your alignment dials and you have your st status LED, your fast flicker, your slow flicker, uh, your constant on and then you're off. And again, remember no matter which one that you're working with to always start on the transmitter side and end up on the receiver side. Now, one thing that we don't have in this presentation today is a is the pointing out of where on the receiver side the, those negative and positive terminals are so that you know if you're getting to three volts or not. If you look right where the status LED is, that box, yep, thank you, Mark. Uh, right there's your negative terminal, over there's your positive terminal, so that way you can hook up your voltmeter and make sure that you're getting three volts or as close to three volts as you can get it. So, uh, last couple of slides here that we want to we want to point out. The first thing that we're going to talk about is the pulse beam technology. Uh, the pulse beam technology to really break it down for you is it, pretty simple. What it does is it just helps to differentiate between a constant light source like headlights or even sunlight um, to hey this is actually the the light coming from the beam. So what it does is it turns off and on extremely fast. Uh, so that way there's a pulse. That way, uh, sometimes if you if you take a camera, uh, we've seen, plenty of us have seen where someone recorded the screen of their TV back in the day, and you would see a little line going up, uh, or you would see it was kind of flickering, kind of the same idea. It's just not always on, so that way, it just in milliseconds, it knows, oh yeah, that's what I'm supposed to be getting uh, instead of a constant light source. Uh, next, what we can do is just show you a, a, quick, uh, a quick example of why it's important to use different channels, either one and three together or two and four together, um, because the way that it repeats, that's what this, and, and the way that the pattern is set up, that's why uh, it's important. This is just kind of a quick example of what that looks like. Um, so that way you can set it correctly. Uh, to show you the, the beam frequency selector on the next slide, um, this just shows you on the side of the device, it's very simple. It's just one simple dial on this device to set whatever frequency to avoid crosstalk that you want it to communicate on. So again, you can see in your examples here, you'll want to use transmitter receiver one and one. The next transmitter and receiver, you want to be three and three if you're using them together. Obviously, if it's a lone application um, and it's uh, just a, something that's standing on by its own, it won't matter as much, uh, but you still want to make sure that your transmitter and your receiver match up. And lastly, second to last, 
the beam interruption adjustment switch that Mark pointed out for us, the where you find that is in the front um, of the receiver, and you can adjust that there as well. Um, next, we have the DQ output. We won't bore you with going through that again, but it, it has the same exact uh, feature on that as well. What I want to do is show you the tamper. Uh, again, just to point out, probably the tamper that you're going to have the most amount of trouble with would be the tamper on the back. Uh, so make sure that if it's secured to a brick wall, they're not always even. My garage isn't even. And the, the other week when I was installing these, um, I had to make sure, okay, it's going to be flat. It's going to be pushed down the whole way. Um, and that way I don't have any issues there. Um, we have the same battery saving timer function that we talked about as well, uh, so keep that in mind as well. Um, lastly, before we get into any questions, uh, earlier we had said maybe just keep an open mind. Um, I can remember when it was my first time when I was working for a dealer that I was allowed to travel outside of the state uh, and go overnight for a trip, and I can remember that was like awesome to me. And I drove from Pennsylvania to Connecticut, uh, like a six hour drive. And I, I got to go have something to, to eat. And the next day I was to wake up and do a high profile customer and uh, try to install the system. Well, uh, unfortunately, one of the devices was a legacy frequency uh, driveway alert. And it really just measured mag uh, the magnetics in the earth and the magnetics of a car or, or just and if it noticed that, it would essentially send a notification. And um, I can tell you this much. If I had this with the power of, of Power G, with the distance, with the encryption, with the reliability, it would have made my life a lot easier when I was installing um, because that, that little device that measured the, magne the, the magnetic field of the Earth just didn't ever do the job. So that's one way. Another way that we can look at using these um, these photo beams is for automation. So not only can you get a notification if you put this down in a driveway, like a longer driveway, and can you have the lights turn on, you can get a notification. Um, you can make a lot of things happen uh, with the, with, with the alarm.com or partner in the back end. Uh, you can make a lot of different things happen that help the customer look at this as not just someone's trying to get into my, my yard or someone has approached my business that shouldn't be where they are. Uh, I know I live very closely to a um, a place that sells mulch. Uh, how cool would it be if I could go to that place that sells mulch and says, look, if, if you put this on either side of, of the storage areas where you store your stone and your mulch, you can make the parking lot lights turn on uh, if you're pairing them to like a Z-Wave light switch. Uh, so just keep an open mind on um, how you can use these devices. And with that, I guess we'll get into any questions that we can answer. Neil, have there been any questions that have come in? Um, we've answered most of them. There is a few questions about battery life expectancy. Anybody uh, okay. want to tackle that one? So with yeah, sure. four, four batteries on the 350, then you can get a, a six to 10 years. Uh, with two batteries in each side, then it's two to four years. Uh, with the 200 foot range, uh, you have to have two batteries, and you can only have two batteries in each side. It's four to six years. Excellent. Thanks, Mark. Anything else come in? Uh, ironically, a whole bunch just dropped in. I'm, we're just scrolling through them to see. Uh, there was like, ironically, like literally, they came in a, you know, a minute ago. Uh, people are asking about the operating temperature, <clears throat> so it's uh, minus 4 Fahrenheit to plus 40, 140 Fahrenheit uh, or minus 20 Celsius to plus 60 Celsius, uh, so that's in there. Um, we've answered the battery life. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really it. I mean, there is a few other questions which will take a little more digging to look for, so we'll uh, answer those. Uh, we'll email uh, those folks who've asked a question that we haven't been able to get to. Uh, but other than that, great job, guys. Uh, you know, it was too bad that, uh, you know, Dave, your camera's not working because uh, you sound like you sounded like you knew, really knew what you were talking about, which you do, obviously. Um, anyway, so again, this is um, the last, uh, second last episode. We will be doing IQ Lockdown next week. Uh, and other than that, as always, there is an after workshop survey, which we would love to get your feedback. 
you know, what you liked, what you didn't like, you know, what you'd love to see for future uh, as we start designing the next season of this. We uh, we got some pretty cool ideas. Maybe we'll have a little more prize giveaways here and there. Uh, you know, some some, uh, some some swag. But other than that, uh, you know, again, thanks everybody for the time. We will see you next week. And uh, please, uh, please do fill out that after uh, workshop survey because it is uh, your feedback is very important. So thank you everybody, and we will uh, we'll see you next week. And uh, you know, stay safe and enjoy the rest of your week. Thanks, guys. Thank you. See ya.